Hello, everybody. My name is Zina Islam, and I'm the Relations Manager Academia Network at UNICENTER. Today, we're extremely honored to have with us Mr. Emmanuel Fabe, CEO, social business and climate activist, rock climber, a man of multiple talents and passion. He has held many prestigious leadership positions, among which include the Chief Executive Officer of Danone, a world leading food company, along with being as chairman of the board. Our UNOS Network's relationship with Mr. Fabe goes a long way. He has supervised early social business projects with Grameen in Bangladesh and also the creation of Danone Communities in 2006. Mr. Fabe is also a founder and co-chair of the Business and Poverty Action Tank, a social business incubator based in HEC in Paris. Since 2019, he spearheads the Business for Inclusive Growth Initiative, a coalition of 40 global leading companies and partners committed to tackling and promoting inclusive growth. In parallel, Mr. Faber actively contributes to building a global business movement for biodiversity. What an incredible personality. We're extremely honored and proud to have you with us today. Thank you very much. We're also having with us today our super talented moderator, Mr. James Chow, an international television broadcaster and the host of The China Current. He has guest presented in the BBC World News and has earned a special reputation for his many interviews with world leaders in politics, science, and health. And you will get a demonstration of that today. So we have a great speaker and moderator combo today. And without further ado, delay, let's start our session with some welcoming words from Professor Mohamed Yunus. Professor Yunus. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. It's a very happy day for me to be here today with the rock star. And not only rock star, he's a rock climber too. So you have a combination of rock star, rock climber. So that's a identity that we got. It's a wonderful thing to have you with us, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, we, our, our history goes a long way. And uh, maybe many of you will be wondering how our paths crossed in the past. How did we get into touch with each other? Actually, it never crossed. It converged. So ever since it remained conversed, it's a, a theme of social business and everything uh, went together. It's a total uh, commitment to the ideas that we have been promoting and the commitments that we are bringing into the picture. And he took the lead. Uh, so he became a, a kind of activist, uh, rock star uh, for social business and continued to do so. And uh, you'll see uh, his footprints in social business everywhere. Not just footprints, big footprints in every single dimension of social business. Uh, during the discussion, some of this will come up, but uh, he is uh, someone who has made the social business movement uh, go in a big way, in a very high level. It's a, uh, it made a big imprint on many, many young people around the world. That was the reason why we could open um, social business, you know, social business centers in many universities around the world. Uh, the lead was taken by him uh, to create such a center in one leading university in France, uh, HSE France. And ever since it continued to expand and continue to do that. So this is one area that uh, we see, but I will not uh, prolong this, uh, just welcome you, uh, Emmanuel. And he's not only a rock star and a rock climber, is a rock solid human being too. That's the real identity for Emmanuel. And I got uh, James back again. It's wonderful to have you back again, James. Uh, James is a superstar of television in China, uh, TV journalism. So we're very happy to have you both together. And the floor is yours, James. Take it from here and uh, you can bring the discussions. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Yunus, and thank you to you and everyone at the Yunus Center for keeping us alive during this pandemic by bringing us together, not only together, but really bringing us around a common cause, which is not only social business, but of course, leveraging that to improve the human condition and through that the state of the world. So thank you, Professor Yunus, for a lifetime of goodness that you've given us and continue to give us as well. It's a great pleasure to have earned your trust, I hope to say, to be able to moderate this next Unicenter lecture, where as Professor Yunus remarked, we are honored to have 
uh, what I was given the brief of CEO, uh, climate and social business activist. But I think I should put that to one side because I think this is even a bigger title to have a rock solid human being in Emmanuel Fabe. Emmanuel, you have so many, I don't want to use the word fans because that can come across as uh, too surface, but uh, you have many admirers in the world uh, from near and far. And so we are really honored that you would choose this point in your life to converse with us here on record and with a wide audience watching on the live stream. You, of course, were born in Grenoble. So I think you were born to be in the mountains almost. It's at the foot of the French Alps. You later went to Paris to study. You've gone on to become a true world leader in business and social business. What were the early experiences when you cast your mind back to childhood and beyond, what were those experiences that crafted the journey that you continue to experience at the very top? Well, thanks, James, for the kind words. And Professor Yunus, um, I'm only the rock climber. You are the rock star, and we all know that. So let's make sure we get the titles uh, right here. And, uh, and thank you for having me, uh, because as you said, James, um, I mean, you didn't say, but I have to say that uh, being part of this uh, social business crowd uh, around Professor Yunus, the Grameen team, and everyone here uh, is, uh, you know, part of these moments that actually get me energy to go and fight back. Um, so thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm going to get energy from this discussion, uh, from your questions, James, um, and, you know, how much I can contribute to the social business movement is really a, a privilege for me. Um, I don't know exactly when the journey started, but I have these you know, deep memories that uh, the question of justice around me and the fact that there were inequalities, um, you know, even when I was at school was there in, in somewhere in myself in, in the way I was interacting with um, some of the grown-ups. Um, I had the feeling that um, we, we should care for people that, um, and, and certainly kids that were... Um, less privileged than, than we were and that the, you know, the bigger guys should protect the smaller guys and not, not the reverse. Um, and then when I grew up, um, I, uh, I grew uh, uh, in, in a business school. I learned a lot about what, you know, these management mm -hmm. tools, how powerful they could be. Um, uh, I learned about finance in particular, and I had this feeling that finance was going to be a big hammer. And I wanted to make sure that I understood how to use this hammer because it could be for good or for bad. And there is, you know, if you are on one side of the hammer or the other, or the other um, that, that makes a big difference. So I chose to go in finance uh, to understand how it works. And with that as a background, I felt gradually more and more able to tweak the system and play with the system um, and, and start what became this journey of activism within business to get business changed. You see, a lot of people may not equate a business leader with words like equality and justice. They may equate it with profit and advancement. You're obviously a very different person in that basket of communities. But why do you think justice and equality meant so much to you as a child, but also in doing what you do as a CEO today? Well, I mean, it means, I think, for at least two reasons. One, I think personally, this is my engine, and I don't think I like everything I see around me in the world, whether this is about climate. And as you said, I grew up in nature. I, you know, I was climbing mountains in very early days, and I see how mountains are changing right now. Um, you know, we, we, we absolutely see climate change hurting mountains and environments as we speak right now. Um, so as a mountaineer, uh, I, have, I have that. I've actually got friends that got killed by climate change in mountains. Uh, but also, of course, um, in business right now, um, I'm absolutely clear that uh, it's about the resilience of business. You know, if, if we started this journey in Danone, um, and, and I'm sure you, you'll, you'll elaborate on this, but also with this view that uh, it was a matter of long-term survival for our business to get purpose and meaning as a profound engine for the energy and the passion that people were putting behind the business. People are, people are not here to just get profits for the shareholders. 
that's that's not enough to motivate them um you know to for, for them to really go the extra mile to win on the market, they will do that if they understand what the purpose of that business is. And the purpose of that business cannot be just profit. Profit is something which is absolutely necessary because this is the kind of the excess money that you keep for next year, basically, that allows you to invest and to grow and to innovate and to go for research and development. But then how much of this profit do you turn to your shareholders? How much of the profit do you actually keep to grow the mission of the company is really this difficult dialogue where I have always thought as a leader and growing within organizations as a leader was the, the most difficult question, but also the big question about what is the purpose of this organization? So I've always connected between the purpose of my life, which is still a question, but it's about justice overall, and the purpose of the business at which I was growing and whom I became a leader. And I tried to find this sweet spot where both were connected. So I'm going to ask you a question, what I imagine would be on the minds of CEOs and aspiring CEOs watching you now. Uh, is it very difficult to convince your high-level peers that there is a moral profit to be made as well as the financial profit? Do they understand you? I think, I think they do, James. And I think Professor Yunus would probably testify the same. Um, the, 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 you know, it's not like there are bad people and good people. I don't, I don't believe in that. I think we're, you know, we are equally born um, when it comes to what's the purpose of our life. And it's simply that as we go there, there are incentives um, and disincentives in the education that we receive, the business education that we receive, then the career track that we follow, that you have sticks and carrots. And if you always get beaten with a stick or get a carrot, when you do something, at the end of the day, you're adapted to just your brain starts to, you know, just do what gives you the carrots and avoids the sticks. And if you look at the financial markets and overall business, traditional business, is about the more profit you get for me, the, the bigger the carrot will be. And if you don't get profit for me, you'll get a stick. Well, after 20 years and the theories and the Milton Friedman theories and everything else that is there, the, the way business is taught at business schools all over the place is this you know, very narrow minded idea that, and, and it becomes like, you know, for any CEO, it's uh, a reflex. It's not even thinking. It's just the way it is that I need to make more profit. And it doesn't mean that that person is bad or is narrow minded. It's simply that there is a whole other part of herself or himself that has been not developed by the 20 years or the 25 years of incentives that these people were given before they grew as CEOs. But then when they meet people like Professor Yunus or when they speak to their children or when, when, when they suddenly become aware that there is a problem with climate in their business and that is a danger for their business, suddenly they realize. And frankly, I think there is a whole generation of CEOs now that realize. So some of them are doing this for greenwashing because you know, they know that NGOs and governments will be after the companies, but yet they would do it. And that's the first stage. But some others are doing it also because they understand this is about getting a competitive advantage. I'm very clear personally that giving your company a purpose that goes beyond making profit is a competitive advantage because there is a whole generation of young people, young talents that are so important in the knowledge economy that will choose to really go the extra miles for companies that will give them a, uh, a purpose. I'll just give you the example of Danone. Just last year, when we become this first you know, listed entreprise à mission in the world, purpose-driven company, uh, voted by 99% of our shareholders, in one year, Danone uh, ranking in the favorite uh, French company by students went up by 20 ranks in just one year, 20 in the top 50. So, you know, th this additional purpose that we brought into the bylaws of the company was so attractive to the younger generation. And among this younger generation, there is the CEO of Danone in 20 years from now. So I, I think bringing this purpose in uh, the companies, the mission beyond the profit is a competitive advantage in many ways. And I think CEOs start to realize that. And then there is a fraction of CEOs that are really ready to go beyond this edge, which is 
I do it because I think it's good for my business. And I guess, I guess this is where they become activists. And this is why I, I define myself as an activist. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever, but the past few months has demonstrated that I have gone the extra mile. Um, uh, you know, and, and this is where I also meet some people that do that. Maybe not in a big way, in a smaller way. When we started with Professor Yunus 15 years ago, we started in a very small way, but a very meaningful one for many ones. So it's not only a question of how big you try, but it's how hard you try. That makes a difference, I think, as well. I think your last couple of months have demonstrated beyond words what you talk about, mission beyond the profit. To everyone listening at home, I hope that we can share this conversation more deeply. So if you're on social media, you can hashtag Eunice, Y-U-N-U-S, of course, hashtag Eunice and share some of the thoughts that are coming out of Emmanuel Fabe and also as how you hear it. I'm also going to ask everyone at home, Emmanuel, to start sending in their questions to you. So sure. whatever function you're using on Zoom, on Facebook or where else, put your questions into the chat feature and we're going to try and get to at least some of those before our time is up. You know, Manuel, I was going to ask you about rock climbing in terms of how often have you been able to uh, indulge your love for the mountains, both indoors and outdoors in the last couple of weeks, especially. But I think I'm going to pivot that because I hear and sense something much bigger coming from you. When you rock climb and as you rock climbed and climbed mountains over the years, where have you scaled to? And in terms of witnessing the evolving climate and the evolving damage of climate change, what have you seen up close? Oh, um, probably what is the most um, striking thing is uh, how ice fields are disappearing in mountains and the temperature. Uh, variations in including in summertime um, you know is is really changing the permafrost so this part of the mountain soil which is frozen and deep freezes during the day uh, is much bigger now much wider in the soil and it's much lower in altitude and it means that basically the mountain rocks are melting down and that creates you know, landslides and avalanches that are just killing people. And you know, in avalanches, I lost, I think, seven of my friends over the last uh, 10 years, really. Um, and so, yeah, the, the climate change is really hurting mountains that way. And, and I think, I mean, that's not to today, I guess, but uh, people don't understand that mountains are a huge regulators of climate because the silicates, which is 98% of the rocks on the mountains, uh, whether this is in the Himalaya or in the Alps or in Yosemite, um, they, when the rain is coming, um, the chemical reaction is draining uh, two carbon molecules into the water, into the rivers, into the oceans, where there is another carbon uh, um, molecule which is released. But the net is that this process is actually sinking carbon into the ocean. So the biggest sink uh, of carbon in the world beyond the Amazonian, uh, Amazonian forest is Himalaya. There are calculations that really see how the Ganges River and the Himalayan chains are a huge sink uh, of carbon and therefore a big regulator of climate uh, around the whole, um, not only the Indian subcontinent and Bangladesh and other countries, but really at the world level. So mountains do play a critical role uh, in, the, in, in the way uh, climate is, is evolving as well. So that's how far it can it can come when it uh, you know when we speak about protecting mountain environment as well. Well, we you know send you our condolences for the loss of your friends over the years, as we do, of course, on behalf of the world for the loss of people in this pandemic. This has been an extraordinary year and a half for the world, and it's been an extraordinary couple of months for you as well. Drawing on your skills as a mountaineer, as a rock climber, you have to know how to use the different sets of muscles in your body and to be able to use them in balance. How have you been able to balance those past couple of weeks and months in your own life? 
Well, I, I guess I was, um, you know, I was hurt like everyone else. What, 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 what strikes me really is how this pandemic has brought us to realize that whether you feel you're powerful, whether you feel you're rich, whether you feel you're in good or bad shape, we are all being hurt. Um, and, and, and really, the early days, and exactly a year ago, we just did not know how much, how far it would go. No one knew anything. It started in China, then we had factories in Iran, in, uh, of course, in Bangladesh, uh, in India, then came in Italy, in Brazil, the whole of Europe, then the US, etc. It you know, spread all across the map of, of the Danone factories and the Danone sites, etc. Um, and it was a you know in, incredible amount of pressure to get the food system continue to work and deliver products for for the consumers um, and the babies and the patients. Um, and then you know what really struck me is how dependent we were on each other. Um, and basically, you know, most of the economy, not the economy that Professor Yunus would, you know, teach and, and would create with social business, but the mainstream economy is about making people independent from each other. I want to own more. Uh, you know, I want to have an insurance policy. I want to be able to isolate myself from others. I'm, you know, I, I can be prepared to look at others as competitors or aliens or even you know, dangerous for me. So I want a house, I want two cars, I want whatever, I don't know, a wall, I want locks, etc. The result is that this virus is making us entirely dependent on each other. And we all know that in all countries that the most critical person were the front line, the first line people, were people that were the lowest paid in our traditional Western kind of economies which really flipped the whole mental um, you know, equation and systems and ideas that we had previously. We were depending on the people that we had made the most vulnerable in our economic system. Um, I was struck as a person by this. And I think it really pushed even harder on me in terms of thinking about, you know, rethinking basically the, the model where, again, uh, it was very clear on that day that there would not be market economy anymore if there was no social justice. Because these people got pay raises in many, many countries just because people, re I mean, governments realized and companies realized that they needed them to go to work despite the risks. Um, so it, it was an incredible realization for me as a leader of where we needed to put the needle much you know, further down the road of justice and dealing with inequalities uh, in this pandemic. Well, for 25 years, as uh, I think only a few people don't know this, but for 25 years, you were a key figure in the Danone ecosystem, uh, the food products group, of course. It was founded a year after the 1980 flu pandemic by a doctor who popularized yogurt, which we take for granted today uh, as recreational eating, but popularized yogurt as a treatment for digestive and intestinal conditions. Has health always been the center of your focus? We know in the personal life, but I guess also in your professional life too. Yeah, I think it started way before me at Danone. And actually, it was very interesting that um, you know, the company was threatened in a way by a hostile takeover uh, in 2005. And um, the CEO of the company by then was the son of the founder. Uh, he had become the CEO, becoming being the son of the founder of the company, not the 1998 founders, but the sort of the guy that made Danone what it became, um, you know, today uh, in the 70s. Um, and we sat down together during this threat and thought about, you know, why would we say yes or no to this offer? Why would we recommend, um, to, what, what would we recommend to our board if, you know, that became a reality? And basically it became obvious that the, 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 the biggest reason why we should say no or we could say no is because this company under our management would really do something unique that other companies would not do. And this is where the mission of Danone started. 
we, we sort of isolated the mission, defined the mission beyond the profit, becoming bringing health through food to as many people as possible, which was looping back to where it started is exactly as you said, you know, after the pan, the the the, the span what we call Spanish flu in French, um, which is this uh, this flu um, which killed so many. Um, and and bacterias and ferments in the yogurt are good for your immune system. And so we focus on that. And this is actually during this process of how can we think beyond profit and really go to the mission that is where there was this encounter with Professor Yunus and social business. Well, Professor Yunus calls your stories not as overlapping or an encounter, but he calls it a convergence how you both came together and were driven for something. I've seen you both uh, in action over the Social Business Summit in Bangkok a couple of years ago. When you come together, you come together for multiple reasons, ultimately for social justice, but uh, for climate change, of course, the biggest issue perhaps of our times. It threatens not only uh, the well-being of our planet, but our survivability as the human race. And then of course, you have a very, very unique lens by which to reach justice, which is social business. How does this all connect? So if you look at uh, your own interests and then climate change as a rock climber, how does all that lead to your work today with Professor Yunus and what you've created, which we'll go into with more detail a bit later on social business? Yeah, well, I guess um, maybe I'll start it from, I, I really believe that, um, the modern um, theory of economics has completely lost perspective of the way we value things in our accounts, in the GDP, in the PL of the companies. One example, talking about nature and climate, is that climate is worth zero. Um, you know, the water we extract from the soil, we take from the river, is worth zero. Uh, the oil that we get from the pits is worth zero in the accounts. What we pay is the cost of extracting the oil. But the fact that nature took hundreds of millions of years to make it from a rock to oil, this process is valorized zero. The same goes for carbon. In agriculture, for a business like Danone, climate change is not only about saving the planet or saving humanity or humankind, it's about saving the business because the biggest victim and the biggest polluter in terms of greenhouse gas um, emissions in the world is agriculture. But agriculture turning intensive, big chemical uh, kind of, uh, or GMO, um, you know, uh, um, agriculture, if you turn it into agroforestry, agroecology, you actually sink carbon back into the soil. You restore soil health. So you prepare the agriculture of tomorrow. So this is where there is a direct link between the kind of agriculture that you are using with climate change as a food company. So that's on the climate side. Um, where I think it, 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 you know, uh, we converged, it, it was on this idea that we were looking for creating the evidence that there was a deep, deep way of looking at our mission as a company, bring health through food to as many people as possible. We looked with Professor Yunus at bringing that to the poorest people we could find, working with the poorest farmers that we would find, you know, and, and, and working with the poorest ladies that we could find to be entrepreneurs that would distribute our products and creating a very special small factory that could be operated by people you know, that would not be trained engineers, but that would be local people that we would recruit in the cities around very, very locally. So it was like finding the dream of what would be a pilot case for the rest of the world on how far you can go uh, with uh, a business that would be entirely driven by its social mission. So it was not only about balancing profit and purpose, it was entirely about going for the purpose. And any profit would be entirely replowed back into the mission. No dividend would be served. And this is what Professor Yunus brought on the table 
uh, when he met uh, the, the chairman of that moment, uh, Franck Ribou, to propose that we would start a joint venture to create a factory of that kind. And this is how we, as you said, not cross but converge, Professor Yunus, because I think our paths were completely linked when we started that and continued then to grow um, you know, a number of other businesses around the same kind of model. Let's talk more about that and unpack what that means, because the convergence of your stories led to the creation of Danone Communities, a venture capital fund investing in social businesses that then enables entrepreneurs to achieve sustainable and social impact. You talk about working with the poorest of the poor, with our weakest, most vulnerable, most fragile communities and individuals and families, of course. Um, what are some of the examples of the direct impact that you've had? And when you think about some of the stories and people that you've met, who comes to mind? Well, um, Danone Communities has grown um, now as a you know, a venture capital fund that has about 12 different ventures around the world uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia, starting with Bangladesh, but then grew out of Southeast Asia to India, for instance, where we cooperate a business with the Nandi Foundation um, called uh, the Nandi Water Community Services business, where we deliver uh, water at a very affordable price, reverse osmosis uh, treated water to more than 500 uh, villages there. In total, the water business uh, of Danone Water Community is serving about 11 million people around the world right now in the social business way. So not serving any dividend, only the profit is there to make the business grow and invest in, uh, in more quality, more safety, um, growing uh, the, the new uh, villages, etc. So that's on, on one side. Um, but another way of looking at it is that Danone Communities, as you said, is a very special venture capital fund. It's a listed fund, first of all, which is a, you know, a very peculiar thing. Uh, we, got some, we had to negotiate with the French uh, SEC to get authorization to do that. And interestingly, other people that it, uh, that it impacted is Danone's employees because we created this scheme where the profit sharing uh, agreement that Danone has with their employees, we allowed employees to either take it in cash or take it in Danone shares with a discount, but we also allowed them to take it through becoming the owners of a unit of Danone communities, which did not make any more than a half a percent of return every year, half a percent. So very, very low return. And guess what? A third of all the employees to whom we proposed that for the last 15 years said, yes, I want to choose that option. So they made this kind of a stupid, in a way, irrational financial uh, decision that they could take their cash and make a 5% return at any bank. They could take a Danon share with a 20% discount, or they could take a Danon communities unit that would deliver only half a percent of return. And they decided to take this one, which frankly, Milton Friedman would have said, these people are crazy, they would never do that. Well, now they did, a third of all the employees did that every year. Now 50% of all employees are doing this every year. So that now this uh, Danone Communities Fund, more than half of the total fund or nearly half of the total fund now is owned by the Danone employees because they've got all their savings into this system. So you could say that all the people that it impacted is all these employees, because you know, becoming the owners of that means they have decided that they would want to be part of the social business uh, family, which I think is going to grow. And it's important to impact not only the beneficiaries, but also the people that are ready to finance it. Back to the CEOs, back to the managers, back to the employees, back to the entrepreneurs that around this call that, that want to twist the way they do business to, for a greater good and maybe a lower profit. We've got a couple of questions beginning to uh, come in, uh, Emmanuel, and we're going to ask people to keep them coming in as well. Um, we're going to take one or two of them in just a moment, but I think your, your, your response to... Uh, how Danone Communities has evolved is very interesting. 
looking back and looking forward, is there anything that you would have done differently? And in what area would you make that adjustment? Wow, that's a big question. It's <laughs> is it a good question? Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it is the question. Um, I think I would have made uh, Danan communities even bigger in uh, the employee community of Danon. And we were blessed by Professor Yunus and the Grammin team to be with us at uh, you know, the AGM of Danon with uh, then right after the AGM of the shareholders, there were also the AGM, the general meeting of Danon communities in Paris. And you had like 2000 people in the room. Um, you know, in the same room as the AGM of Danone. So I, I can say that I had the feeling that, you know, what else could we do? We had these huge crowds around Professor Yunus in some big theaters with 4,000 people, you know, uh, in Paris, just speaking to uh, other managers or young people, other companies. So, yeah, my feeling was that we were doing as much as we could, but I think we could have done it uh, bigger and stronger in particular within the company itself. Uh, so that's, you know, that's probably uh, one thing. I think another one is, um, it, maybe it was too early days, but it's clear now that this term ESG, environment, social, and governance is everywhere in what the financial markets are using now, the big investors, the Black Rocks and Vanguards and State Streets and others. Of course, there is a lot of speaking um, not yet a lot of actions, but I think that we are in a way at a turning point, in a way, um, and we could have advocated Danon communities as a case for this because one thing today is that when people speak about impact, impact funds, and impact is a big word as well now in finance, right now they say you can have impact and profit all together the same way. You don't need to go um, you know, lower than market rate. And personally, I do have a big question about this. So what I would have done probably differently, I would have accelerated some of what Professor Yunus mentioned, which is this university work, the HSC work. I mean, HSC is uh, a, a common friend of Professor Yunus and myself, Benedict Fevre Tavigno. She, she is a teacher at HSC and this is how we met basically. So HSC has been doing great things, but I know, uh, you know, many other universities have done that, Caledonian University in the UK, et cetera, and others. Um, but I think the, the DNA and the software of economics has not turned fast enough. And, and we really need to, you know, to have that. So one thing I'm doing right now, speaking about the future is, I'm working with the Club of Rome you know, the guys that wrote this report in 1972, the Meadows report that said growth is not going to be infinite. We need to look at things differently because this will be the 50th, 50th year of the, this report next year. And they're working on, uh, you know, transformational economics on how should we rewrite the economics. And of course, social business should be, should be part of that. Okay, we've got a couple of, well, suddenly the questions have exploded online over here. So maybe we take them in parts and uh, maybe we can get some quick responses to some of these. Uh, there's okay. a big question in amongst here, which I'll leave towards the end. Uh, but let's start off with uh, Louise Longlois, who asks, do you think a company's mission is in danger when there is a change in its global governance? Uh, yes, it is in danger and it needs to be protected because um, there is no way that governance is where things start and, will, and, 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 you know, and are being changed in terms of strategy. So this is where I think a uh, special um, um, uh, framework are very important to protect the mission of a company when there is a change of governance. And being an entreprise à mission or public benefit corporation is actually a framework that protects the mission when there is a governance change, much more than if there was not that. Being a social business in the unus sense of social business is a huge protection. If you change the governance of the company, if it is a social business, it has in its bylaws that it will not serve dividends. It's a very important protection. So I think uh, writing the DNA of the mission in uh, or 
writing the mission in the DNA of the company is a big protection when there is a change in governance because no doubt that governance is bringing changes potentially in the way the mission is being run. Okay, another question for you here. This comes from Marcelo Palazzi, who asks Emmanuel this. How could Unis Social Business and B Corp work together to grow the movement of business for good exponentially? And he's from the B Lab. Yeah. Hi, Marcello. As a good friend. Um, let's, let's take this, company, th this discussion uh, offline, Marcello, because I think it's a very good question. And I'd love to you know, see how Professor Yunus, the Grameen team, the YSB business, you know, team um, and, and B Corp can uh, join together. Because in a way, um, you know, the, the Yunus social business model um, is uh, probably the extreme um, kind of B Corp that you can think of. Um, so there is no doubt that to me, there are big connections. And I wouldn't be friends of both of you if that, there wouldn't be these connections. So let's, yeah, let's, let's discuss that. Well, pegging on to that, one of the questions I had for you before we go back to the audience is this. I mean, what's the role of business in any community? I imagine there are a lot of people, especially young people, thinking about their own role in life as this world continues to rapidly change. I mean, what's the role of business, especially at a time of multiple crises that are misshaping our social, economic, sanitary, and environmental conditions? Well, I'm, I'm super clear on this now. Um, there will not be climate justice and social justice without business being the fundamental part of the solution. But I can write it down the other way around, which is that there will not be market economy in 20 years from now if market economy doesn't aim at more social justice and at more climate justice, one way or the other. Because market economy will disappear because of violence. If market economy continues to accumulate uh, wealth uh, and concentrate wealth, wealth in a world, it's a time bomb. It's just ticking. So it's very clear. The relationship is super simple. Business can and has to be the fundamental solution. And this is where all the people around this audience are connected to this because Professor Yunus is insisting on the fact that you don't need to be an employee and you don't need to be asking for a job as an entrepreneur, as a social entrepreneur, as a social business entrepreneur. You're a giver of job, not a taker of job. And so, you know, first of all, there is this whole generation that, and, and that includes many of the B Corp people, basically. B Corp is a wonderful collection of nearly now 5,000 companies. Most of them are entrepreneurial, small startups, et cetera. But on the other side, there is also the, the big companies because they are there and you can't forget them. And every effort that uh, Professor Yunus has made to have them joining the social business crowd, every effort that Marcello Palazzi at B Corp has done to have these big companies part of the crowd, and of course, Danone is one of them in the big hope world, is very important. Um, and, but that connects to people because I'll tell you one thing, for those CEOs that are not convinced yet, or their boards that are even looking backwards instead of looking forward as I think they should, which is a mistake by the boards, because they, are, you know, they, they don't get the proper governance, they don't get the proper incentives, the boards are not incentived in, in the right way in most listed companies. I think the force for change, and we all know that, Marcello knows that, Professor Yunus knows that, is the younger employees. I see employee coalitions now that have started to write and ask for change in the companies. Some are asking you know, as a counterpower, but some are also asking as a force for good within the company. And CEOs are, you know, I'm absolutely clear and I'm speaking to my peers, they will listen carefully to what their mostly talented and passionate employees will tell them about where the company should go for its own purpose and its own resilience. So whether you're an employee um, or whether you are an entrepreneur, your passion for change is going to make a difference and I'm sure it will have an impact. Is that passion alone what drives the sustainability of social business? Or as Medina Zakir asks you, social preneurship, how do you make that sustainable? And how do you bring people on board with you? 
Well, I think um, it's maybe back to the very early question you asked, which is, um, you know, Professor Yunus quite use, you know, quite um, often says money will make you happy, but social business will make you super happy. And I think a, a number of people, uh, you know, of all generations around me are realizing that in, indeed, there is so much that, that, that money can bring and seeking for money by, you know, competing with others and by cheating against others and by bullying others as you would do, you know, if, if you know, business was not regulated, this is what would happen, is actually not going to bring so much happiness to them. And there are so many rich people that are just unhappy and just are fighting to just, you know, keep their ranking in the list of X or Y kind of big, you know, big media about how rich people they are. I mean, this is not being happy. And many people are realizing that um, you can achieve the meaning of your life through business, whether you are an intrapreneur or an entrepreneur, provided you are not only an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur with a meaning, with a purpose. And this is where the word social is so important. One of the big campaigns that Professor Yunus, not just campaigns, but one of the big social movements that Professor Yunus uh, spearheaded over the past uh, 12 months in particular, was to make the COVID-19 vaccines a common good. And I think I may be right, but I could be wrong, Emmanuel, that you are one of the signatories amongst the global leaders to put their name and their commitment to that call. Because one person asks if you would personally support the movement in favour of the vaccines as a common public good, meaning suspending the IP rights on the patents. Yes, I would. Uh, I would. And I have to say that uh, to be uh, in a way, realistic, including because I'm speaking also to some people, uh, you know, around the, the UN invoice for COVID um, in a number of other situations. Uh, and I'm also, uh, you know, part of coalitions, as you uh, mentioned, some of them include these big pharmaceutical companies. Um, they are under uh, um, a system where they have pressures on the return that they make on their research. And this is legitimate. The money that they are using is a money that was given uh, or that was invested by shareholders. And these shareholders did not choose to save the world. They may, they may be wrong about it, but they did not give their money to get a return from these pharmaceutical companies um, just to save the world. They wanted a return. So what you need is to create a level playing field through public money to make sure that you also protect these companies if they decide to go off with um, the, uh, um, in, in a way, a copyleft approach, not a copyright approach uh, to the vaccine. So this is where there is a tricky situation, uh, basically, that needs to be dealt with for a cause, which I think is the right cause and make sure, as you just said, that this vaccine and the many that will need to be developed against all the variants of the pandemic in the future, even more important than the, you know, the, the moment right now, is being dealt with as a common good. Well, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to run through some questions just to share with you, Emmanuel, but also with our audience to provide a map of what people are thinking about. Uh, Lucas Posega says, Mr. Faber, thank you for being with us. We all here agree that business must serve the needs of the planet and society in line with their core activities. Do you see a structural change that big corporations can and perhaps must commit so that they can fulfill this purpose more effectively and secure a livable future for future generations? Uh, Lucille has uh, both a comment and a question. We have to change the capitalist model to face with the social and climate urgencies. Do you think that social business can be this new paradigm? And how do you embark on that path of financial institutions? Uh, then there were a couple of other questions, uh, one from uh, uh, one of our friends, Christian Van Izet, who says, can CEOs really change their business to do good? What do CEOs need to have as a backing to make sure they really make that change happen? And also Jad Moza says, hi, Manuel, I'm working for the Devash team. 
Would you have some tips to motivate young activists to keep their energy to fight for the good cause and engage ourselves in that transition, so and so forth? And I think I'll just share one more from Olivier Morel, who says, aside from the Club of Rome, the Club of Budapest insists on a cultural shift to support a sustainable development. What is your take on the power of interchange to lead outer change and how do you support inner change within a collective dynamic? Those are just some thoughts for us all to uh, think through, but I think I'll finish off with uh, a question and a suggestion from two different people. One question comes from Jean, he says, what do you plan to do in the next five years? And one suggestion from someone else says, do you think Emmanuel should be the CEO of a major pharmaceutical company in this pandemic? So the second question is not for me, apparently, so I will not answer it. And the first question is for me, uh, although the second might be part of the first question of what I do in the next five years. Um, the truth is, I don't know, my friends, um, and I don't want to know because I was blessed by um, you know, being part of this incredible company for 25 years, uh, Danone. It, it, it became, in a, in a bit of a way, it became you know, my family or a family for me, growing um, you know, as, a, as a person um, uh, in, in this company with so many great people. I was entrusted by uh, my previous predecessor by a lot of trust to start things and try things, including social business with Professor Yunus that brought so much to the company and certainly to myself to grow as a, you know, in what fundamentally I, I believe. So I, I'm immensely grateful for that. And at the same time, I, I never had this privilege, basically, that I am in today uh, of a situation where I have never been as free to think about where I want to commit myself next for the next five or 10 years. And I don't want to treat this privilege lightly. I really want to, you know, let it deeply metabolize and, and, and you know, discussing with people like you and having these sort of sessions is also helping me to metabolize and think about the suggestions that you're making, the questions you're asking, the energy that comes from the social business crowd, um, is being part of what I'm going to, I want to go through in the next several months, hopefully, before I have to decide and jump back into the big action time. So for the time being, for me, it's time to share, to listen, to uh, read much more than I did and try to be as diverse as possible in the, in the people, kind of people that I'm meeting to just uh, listen to where I will be most useful to um, you know, next and where I will thrive as a person uh, most, whether this is big or small, you know, far or close to where I am, for me is not a big criteria. I just want it to be, uh, you know, where I feel that's the place for me. We'll see that later. Well, I wonder whether in 12 months you'll give us permission to speak to you again on record to see where you are and to join you in the movement <laughs> that I have no doubt you'll be leading globally at that time once again. But in the meantime, before we hand over to Professor Yunus, uh, may we convey to you not only our best wishes, but also to your three children and to everybody at home. This is really the most important time to be with family, which is the base of all community. Thank you very much, Mr. Faber. And Professor Yunus, the other part of this convergence of stories that so many years ago led to great things with Danone and Danone communities, may I ask you to add your take, having heard Emmanuel speak? Well, thank you. It's a, it's a very enthralling uh, conversation. But, uh, thank you, uh, James, for bringing that up. Uh, you helped to take this uh, discussion in a very diverse way, uh, very many issues you brought in. And thank you, Emmanuel, for responding to this. And uh, for the first time, I saw how many different dimensions you have in your con conversations and your work. Uh, and sometimes I was thinking as, as we were listening, it's almost like an epic story. You have a, uh, one flow of the story on the, and then branches out to different things and each one is important. And then it sub branches into something else, never ending but it's always have a common destination that you started with the whole conversation, the purpose. And that is what you started out with. And all these things and the elaborations and all the things happening. And that uh, led me to uh, the final question that you asked, 
about what uh, Emmanuel will do. And he was saying that he'll think about it and read. And maybe I would add one more word to write also, uh, not just read. Uh, if you ever think of uh, writing anything, this could be your uh, first, uh, uh, this, if you take the, all the issues in the conversation together, uh, that gives you the essence of what you want to say, what you want to do, what you did and what you want to do. So that will give you a kind of structure to uh, elaborate uh, each one of them. Then you have a whole thing that you are trying to struggle with. Uh, we, are, we are privileged to hear this, all the conversation that you and uh, Emmanuel put together. And I want to thank Emmanuel for doing this. I'm sure uh, this will be a, a conversation which all the audience will remember for many, uh, many uh, long time. And at the same time, they will revisit the YouTube and other uh, recording that the videos that they will have so that they can go back to what you have heard and what it mean and which direction they would like to go. Because many things that you pointed out, uh, particularly the one that stuck with me uh, was as, as you started out saying, uh, the finance was your first patient that you got involved with and finance as a hammer. I never thought about that. Finance is a hammer, exactly. If you have the handle with that finance, you hammer and you crush somebody and hit it. So you, uh, you have a hammer, someone who is getting the other end of it and somebody is holding the uh, stick to the hammer and making pass uh, whatever thing that he or she wants to do. So that's a hammer, how, how to make it something different uh, instead of a hammer instead of something to redesign our life and so on. And that's what the work that I was involved with. So I, I was listening to you on that particular subject that uh, it's how you saw uh, right from the beginning as you were growing up, uh, was looking at finance as a hammer. So that could be one of the starting points in your, in your whatever writing that you'll be doing in, in the future. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Emmanuel, for sparing this time and uh, sharing this. Uh, we are very privileged to have you with us, and I'm sure we'll have this conversation many times in future also. And thank you, James, for bringing this all up. And I'll, on behalf of all the audience that uh, attended today, I would like to uh, give our heartful gratitude, express our heartful gratitude to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much both to Professor Yunus and to Mr. Emmanuel Faber. And may I hand things over to Ms. Zinat Islam, who is the Relationship Manager over at the Yunus Center in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you, Mr. Faber. This has really been an incredible conversation. Very clear. The message has been very clear and very thorough. And I think something we can all think about, I think all the business people listening, students, um, this is something to think about. And as uh, Professor Yunus mentioned about writing, I think, Mr. Faber, your experiences and your passion, I feel like it really came out through this conversation. It would be great to be in a book, um, keep me in one of the books behind Professor Yunus on his bookshelf and for our <laughs> students, um, our university students who are doing social business courses all over the world. HEC provides a certificate course on social business. So your experience, your passion um, on a book would be something great to read. I think um, young people are more aware. Um, we probably didn't read about climate change and everything when we were young, but kids nowadays are. And as you said, you know, they're the future CEOs. So if they start changing things from a childhood, I mean, that's the best. I mean, we hope to get a better world sooner. So with that, I really, really appreciate uh, from the Center team and from all of you, us watching. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you very much, James, for bringing it out. And with that, we would like to conclude our session, uh, with, but with a big uh, round of applause for Thanks. all of you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. And um, uh, now we would play a slideshow on uh, some of our upcoming events. Um, we have Social Business Day coming up in June, along with our Social Business Forum, which will be done virtually and uh, live mix uh, based in Kampala, Uganda. So we welcome everyone to join it. Um, and till then, stay safe, um, be he healthy, and watch our events online. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I Thank request you. the tech team to come to the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you.